Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Tonight I'm going to share with you one of my latest projects and that is the meteor fence. I'm going to show you how it works and how it demonstrates the curvature of the Earth. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now, although this appears to be written in Dutch, I think we can get the general idea from this illustration. One way to detect meteors is to use a distant radio station to try and literally light them up as they come through our atmosphere 60 to 100 kilometers above the Earth. And the way that works is this. We have a radio station that is well over the horizon from our observer location over here. Now, FM radio stations and radars generally are line of sight instruments. In other words, in order for them to eliminate a target, that target has to be in a line of sight with them. Now, if you know the frequency, you can use a radar for that. If not, you can use a distant FM station. Because again, unlike AM stations, which skip off of the ionosphere, FM stations have to be line of sight. You have to be able to see the top of the antenna in order to receive the signal and as a result, their range is generally around 40 miles. But what if I'm 50 or 60 miles away? I can't see this radio station, and as a result, I can't receive its signal. However, if a meteor goes ripping through the upper atmosphere between 60 and 100 kilometers above the Earth, it leaves behind it a trail of ionized gas. That ionized gas acts as a reflector for the radio station. And in the brief moment that that trail is persistent, I can actually bounce this radio beam off of that trail of gas and back down to my antenna. Now the beauty of this is it doesn't cost very much money to do this, and what you're essentially building in your garage is what's called a forward scatter radar. Traditional radar sends a pulse out which bounces off of an object and returns to the sending station. That's backscan radar. Now forward scan radar means that you have a radio source coming from another location that bounces off of an object and then over to you. That's the way this system works. And the basis of the system is you have to have an FM TV antenna, such as this one that I bought. These run about $30 brand new. You can probably find one in a junkyard or on your neighbor's roof for free. Just make sure you ask them before you go take it down. Now this particular antenna, I just drilled a hole in the top of a post of my dog pen, stuck a pipe in it, and bent it up about 35 degrees. Then what I did was I took a piece of coax cable and I plugged it into the antenna. Now on the other end of the coax cable is something called a software-defined radio dongle. You can pick these up on eBay for about $30. So my total investment in this is $60 so far. And this plugs right into your computer with a USB port. And then you use some software and basically make your computer a radio. And let me show you what that looks like on mine. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Before we set this whole thing up and point it someplace, we have to figure out where to point it. And the way that you do that is you research your local radio stations out to probably two or 300 miles. And what you want is a radio station that's on a frequency that's not shared by another radio station in the area, at least not in that general direction. And after doing some research, I found a radio station that I could use, and that is 102.3 FM in Big Rapids, Michigan. Now, there are several other radio stations that are neighbor radio stations in frequency. So, for example, here is Big Rapids, Michigan. We have a radio station on a different frequency that's a little further out in a little town called Pentwater, Michigan, which is right here on the shore of Lake Michigan. And directly behind me, we have a radio station in Bad Axe, Michigan, in the thumb of Michigan. So we've got a nice line that goes along the 44th parallel right across the state of Michigan, 
where we have radio stations identified that are isolated that we can actually have a look at. And just for good measure, I grabbed a radio station up in Traverse City, Michigan, which is a little bit to the right or the north of that line up in this area. So let's go see how we put this all together. Now, as you recall, what I did was I plugged my software defined radio into my Apple computer. And then I used this program, which was a free program called Cubic SDR. SDR is short for software defined radio. And what that does is it takes the radio frequencies from the antenna, converts them into something that the computer can read, and puts them up on a nice screen like this. Now, this may seem rather confusing, but it really isn't. Let me go through it real quick. In the middle pane right here, you see frequencies that have activity on them. This one right here is a local radio station about 20 miles from me, and you can see right underneath what they call the waterfall where that signal is being recorded. Then there's a little spike right here from that spike in the frequency range there. And then there's kind of like a little bit of a hump right here, a flat line, and then there's another spike out here. So what I did was I used that strong radio signal as a reference and notice that I've got the sensitivity of that middle pane so that it goes up to the top on that strong radio frequency. Now next to it, right here, we have my target frequency of 102.3 megahertz, and you see that's listed right up here. Here's the raw signal that we're getting on that frequency. Now I'm not getting too much on this. I do have a little bit of blue in the background, and that's primarily dust in the air reflecting a little bit of that radio signal down to me. I'm really at the periphery of that radio station. So I do get a little bit of a signal once in a while, and atmospheric effects will give me these horizontal lines. Okay? Now, what we want to look for with meteors are strong vertical lines that are very, very well defined. And we'll have some of those here in a minute. So this is the main frequency that we're listening to right here. Up in this corner, we have that same frequency tuned in, and it's at a higher degree of sensitivity, which is why you're seeing a little bit more activity up here. But what we're going to do is we're going to watch that middle pane on the lower section of the screen. And we're going to look for those vertical lines. And those vertical lines are the meteor trails reflecting that radio station over the horizon to us. So in addition to our signal right here from Big Rapids, this is the signal that's coming in from Traverse City. And as you see, we don't really see that radio station in Traverse City, nor do we see the radio station in Bad Axe. And behind me is the radio station in Pentwater over on the shores of Lake Michigan. So now that we know how to read the graphs, we just wait to see the vertical lines that represent the meteors. But while we're waiting, let's go ahead and kind of go over meteors a little bit. Meteors are chunks of dust and rock coming from outer space. They come from all directions on the Earth. And all else being even, they would basically coat the entire Earth with a meteor impact. Now, occasionally we get something called a meteor shower, which is where we go through a cluster of meteors and get a very high number of them. But barring that, the constant rain of meteors is throughout the Earth. However, that's not really what we see. We see most of the meteors between midnight and noon, rather than between noon and midnight. And that has to do with the rotation of the Earth and the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Now, by noon, I mean when the Sun is directly over a point on the Earth. That is that point's noon. It's not necessarily clock noon. It would be what is called solar noon. Now, in my location, solar noon is about 1.40 in the afternoon. Now, the exact opposite of that time is midnight, or 1.36 a.m. in my case. So what's important about those two times? Well, if you draw a line between the two points on Earth that are 12 noon and 12 midnight, you get a line that's perpendicular to the orbit of the Earth moves in its orbit about the sun in a counterclockwise motion when viewed from the perspective of 
a point above the North Pole of the Earth. And as a result, as the Earth moves in one direction, it has a leading edge and it has a trailing edge in its orbit. Where are the bugs on your car? They're on the windshield. They're not on the back window. So where the point is 12 noon and 12 midnight, you're going to get a set number of meteors. As the Earth moves through its orbit, it's going to run into additional meteors on the leading edge. And on the trailing edge, meteors have to be going faster than the orbital speed of the Earth, which is about 30 miles per second, in order to catch up to the Earth and hit it. You won't get the slower meteors hitting the Earth from the backside, whereas meteors that are sitting, minding their own business in space, are literally going to be run into by the Earth on the leading edge. And that's why we get more meteors between 12 midnight and 12 p.m. Now, that's a meteor right there. As you can see, there's a vertical green line. And that's how meteors appear. They're pretty much right on the center frequency of the radio station. They can be a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right because of something called a Doppler shift. So if the meteor is coming towards you, the frequency of the reflected radio beam that you're going to get is going to be a little bit higher and the meteor trace is going to be shifted a little bit to the right of that center frequency. If it's going away from you, the frequency that is being reflected will be a little bit less than the carrier frequency and it'll appear to the left. Now you can do some very interesting things with this. For example, boy, there's a nice big meteor right there, isn't there? That's what we call a fireball. That's probably, rather than a grain of sand, that's kind of a stone-sized meteor, and, and it creates a more spectacular show. Now, what else can you do with this? Uh, when I first set this up, we had two passes of the International Space Station that were directly over me. And I believe, and some people that were watching it with me believe, that I actually picked up that passage. I'm going to go ahead and do some videos in the future where I'm going to deliberately try and track the ISS and the Chinese space station using this system. We'll also look at the beacons that are on the ISS and the Chinese space station. I was clearly able to pick up the beacon of the Chinese space station the other day. But let me show you a couple of typical meteor and fireball traces. Now this is from the other day with slightly different settings before I got them really down well. But they demonstrate this very nicely. Once again, we have our frequency range here in the middle. This, as you can see, is 102.3. And we're not really getting much of a tracing here. But all of a sudden, we got this huge spike. This is what a meteor looks like on the frequency trace. Now shortly after that spike comes, you see the meteor starting to show up. You can see it here in the main window. And you can see it up here in the detailed finer resolution window. Just a fraction of a second later, you see the entire trail of the meteor in both windows again. Notice the spike is gone now. And as a result, we've seen the end of the trail. A short time later, it's continued to go down the waterfall, both in the main window and in the detailed window. And then eventually it'll go right off the screen. Now here we see something slightly different. Notice that the frequency has been changed. We're at 2250.215 and 2250.720. These are the frequencies for the beacons on the Chinese space station. As you can see right here, I'm picking up the second one very nicely. This is uh, 2250.720. And I started picking this beacon up when the Chinese space station crossed the Rocky Mountains, almost a thousand miles away. And you can see the trace of that beacon underneath on the waterfall. Now, while this may seem as exciting as watching paint dry, it's actually not. It demonstrates the curvature of the Earth because that's the entire principle that this works on. Second of all, 
it's kind of cool that you can do this and you can do this from home. This is science that you can do yourself. Now, finally, I run this through the Discord and generally this is up on the Discord from about midnight my time until about noon the next day. I have that Discord open and there's a link to it in the chat and you can go on in there and we can chat. Um, you can chat with the other people as well. It's just a nice place to kind of hang out and say, oh, there's one. Now, if you don't feel like going into the Discord chat, you can just tune in on YouTube onto my channel, Shamrock Banks Observatory. And you can just watch this throughout the day. There's a couple of meteors right there, as a matter of fact. There's three of them. Let's see if there's a fourth one. Yep, there it is. What happens is sometimes they'll come in as a cluster and they'll hit the atmosphere at different times. That doesn't mean that they're coming in as a train. That means that there's a whole shotgun pattern of them coming in. And as soon as they hit the atmosphere, they leave a trace. It doesn't really tell you exactly where they hit the atmosphere. They could be miles apart. But if they hit the atmosphere one right after the other, you're going to get a little train like that. So if you want to tune into the YouTube channel and just kind of watch this just to pass the time, there's some nice music there. You know, it's a choice between watching science or watching Loafy Girl. Might as well watch science. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing off from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by, and I hope you found this enjoyable. Oh